All right, it's two minutes after two. Unless there's some objections, I'd like to call a meeting to order and welcome all of you to the June 2000, is this 11? 11. 2021. Uh, huh? 2021. 2021, I understand. 2021 general meeting. Before we begin, I want to recognize some folks that are standing, our pictures are here. They are Lori, Jonathan Bacon, Anita, Phil, and Lynn. They have all been so involved in getting this operation going remotely because we're all out here on the end of the line. Though I believe next year we're going to step forward, or next year, next month, we're going to step forward and meet uh, on campus is what I hope. So uh, I just want to recognize their efforts and all of the great things that they've done to help us keep going. And, and it's only through their help that we've been able to get there. All right, moving to the next item. It is President Andrew B. Brown here to comment. Sir, you're up. All right. I figure I must be in a whole lot of trouble then when Andrew comes out. So, <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I always knew that my best friend uh, growing up uh, was also Andy. Um, and the way the parents would tell us apart is he was a year older than I was. And so he was Andrew and I was Andy. So I think I got the better end of the deal on that one. Um, although I was probably in trouble may, way more often than he was. So, uh, well, thanks for letting me join you today. I'm uh, here from the science building and uh uh, you know, it won't be too long. I'll talk about this in a minute. It won't be too long. And this is going to start to look a whole lot different than what it does today. But um, maybe just a, a few thoughts about what's going on on campus and then be happy to answer any questions you all have. Um, it, it certainly has been, you know, this is the understatement of the year, but it's been a, an unusual year to say the least for all of us. Um, it, we've been really fortunate. The protocols that we had on campus kept people safe. Um, we didn't have, you know, the spread on, uh, on campus. Certainly we had people um, uh, get COVID get real sick, and, and, but the protocols worked. And, and so we just didn't have that spread. I mean, even with athletics and, and uh, you know, they had a full, full season, um, including, you know, volleyball uh, ending the season with the national championship. So, um, yeah, it was, and, and like the, 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 the uh, uh, Golden Girls dance team, um, you know, finished uh, second and the third uh, between jazz and hip hop. Um, our debate team uh, had another banner year, um, you know, with, with uh, twin brothers, uh, debaters doing incredibly well. Um, I think they finished overall 36th in the nation and all of higher ed. Um, and if I remember correctly, these are two first year college debaters um, and uh, just did a fantastic job. Model United Nations. I mean, so the the things that we that we believe about our fantastic college uh, came true again this year with with our students um, doing incredibly, incredibly well. Um, you know, we've just wrapped up the commencement season that you all know so well. Um, you know, we had to, we chose to do it um, virtually this year um, with all of the pinning and smaller graduation ceremonies happening in person, although, you know, uh, broadcast um, to a, a broader group so families could participate and so forth because they couldn't be in the room with the graduates. And so it was, it was the best that we could do uh, in the environment we're in. The Nerman um, is back open. We have a, a uh, permanent display. Um, very soon we'll be announcing uh, the, the new um, uh, director of the Nerman. Um, uh, the team is really excited about her joining us, brings a wealth of contemporary art experience to pick up where Bruce, Bruce has left off. Um, and so we're getting, getting excited about her joining us late in the summer. Um, the Midwest Trust Center um, is back open again, and performances will uh, return to campus um, with the fall series. And, and uh, uh, the team is the group's really excited about what that means for us. And 
Um, so we'll be anxious to get you back on campus, not only to meet, but to participate again in the NERMAN and in the, um, the performances at the Midwest Trust Center um, and so forth. We're back now, 100% back to campus. So um, I, I shot a video early this week that went out to campus. And, and in essence, we're saying it's normal operations in an environment that anything but normal. <laughs> So, right. So all offices are open again, uh, but it's summer. So, you know, uh, teaching is predominantly um, online. Um, And so in in many ways, in some ways, it doesn't feel different. And yet parking lots are a whole lot more full than they had been um, because we've got uh, staff and and, uh, faculty and others on campus now on a regular basis. we don't. So when you come to campus, uh, we, we don't require masks on campus at this point, much like you're seeing in society in general. Um, so you, you, you come to campus. What we're, what I do is I carry a mask with me everywhere I go. So the session I've been in uh, today, there's a, a small number of people kind of back in the corner where I was sitting that have their masks on. Well, I'm just going to put my mask on. That will make them more comfortable. Um, you know, that's, I think, and we talk a lot about where does grace fit into this? Um, so um, we are, are returning to normal summer. It looks like a pretty traditional summer for us. Fall from a delivery standpoint, courses standpoint, will be more than 50% face-to-face. Where last year, this whole year, we've been roughly 20% face-to-face. So um, it, it, because we've got lots of students asking to come back to campus and take their classes um, uh, face-to-face. But we also have a lot of students that want the various forms of online. And so um, we'll continue to, to offer a blend of, of online courses. Um, so the, the, the big work ahead of us now is really the complete renovation of the science building. Um, and so... It's about a $30 million construction project. Actually, it'll be a little bit more now. I think it'll be more like $34 million construction project um, in the science building. It'll, it'll spill over into the CLB building um, for the spaces that we use there. Um, and so between this, we'll, we'll start construction actually this summer. Um, we'll use a little bit in the... Um, the uh, uh, WCMT building, trades building, where we'll use some some vacant space in that building to be swing spaces. And so um, over the next two years, the goal is uh, that we'll have the construction project done and, uh, you know, a a major upgrade to our science labs um, and the classrooms and so forth in the science building. So um, if for the folks that are here, it's going to be um, it's going to be interesting. Uh, anybody that's lived through a construction project, um, uh, so we're doing our best to move, um, you know, uh, temporary offices and classrooms, and so we'll be distributed all over campus. Um, but but because of the the space and the uh, WLB building, we we can do some science labs over there. So that, We've got the team's got a really good plan in place, um, and at the end of the day, uh, we'll have um, you know world class uh, collegiate uh, science labs on campus. So very excited about that. Um, uh, you probably you you may be more aware of this than I am. We have nine candidates uh, running for um, four open seats or four seats on. Uh, on the board of trustees. So um, uh, trustee Lawson and trustee Cook are not running again. Um, and so, uh, and, and uh, trustee Cross and trustee Snyder um, are, are, have uh, joined the race again as incumbents. But so we know there'll be at least, at least two new trustees um, this next year. Um, so the, uh, the, the process of elections and all that is now uh, underway. So I'm happy to answer any questions you've got for me. Remember, if you have any questions for Dr. Bound, you'll need to unmute yourself. 
No questions? Oh, I got a quick question. How's enrollment holding up for the summer, Dr. Bound? Summer soft. Um, summer softer than we anticipated. Um, we're down low double digits. Um, and, and we haven't had a summer that's been down um, in a number of years now. Um, you know, even last year in the pandemic, we were flat, um, but we're down. And, and when we talk to students about them coming back and, and, and frankly, what we're hearing a fair amount of is I'm, I'm just whooped. I'm whooped from this online environment. Um, I, I need to take a break. I'm planning to be back in the fall. Um, you know, it, it, and so summer's soft. Um, fortunately, it's a lower enrollment period for us anyway. So being um, down in the summer isn't as impactful as being down in the fall or spring, but I hate that word anyway. So down's not a, I'm not a big fan of down. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Oh, he's got a question. Yes, sir. Are there a number of staff at this point, Dr. Bell, that, that are reluctant to come back to campus? You know, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's yes to no. We've got, so on um, Monday of this week, we had a welcome back. The human resource department did a really nice job put on uh, with staff development, faculty development, had kind of a welcome back sort of, you know, kind of a low key, but festive um, event out in the, in the courtyard. Um, and there are a lot of folks who are just, they're excited to come back. Um, but there are a fair number of folks that are, you know, apprehensive about coming back. And, and, um, so yeah, there, there's a sensitivity in all this of, we need to be back on campus to serve, best serve students, uh, to best serve our colleagues. Um, um, and so there is a mixture of, we're excited to be back. And there are others that are um, probably closer to the other end of the spectrum on this. Um, and it's, you know, how can supervisors, how can others help people be more and more comfortable um, uh, back in the workplace? But it's, you know, like in our office, um, uh, we had plexiglass around workstations and, and uh, Caitlin and Shelby in our office both said, you know what, could that plexiglass come down? I can yeah. see through it, but I feel like I'm caged in and I don't like that. And it's like, if you, you're the one that works there, if you want it to come down, we'll pull it down. And we did, that came down today. So it's a, it's a little bit of uh, anxiousness and a little bit of, oh good, we get to come back. And, <laughs> I, and frankly, we've had a lot of, a lot, of folks that haven't been on campus since March of last year. Oh, I'm, sure. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, walking on campus during the pandemic was unreal for those of us that have been there for so many years. Of that, course. You, know, you don't see anybody, you don't hear anybody. Yeah. It was like a ghost town. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, coming in to that, <laughs> I, you know, I at least had my time in Indiana where we were, you know, when I was on, when we were back on starting to come back to campus, it was a ghost town there too. So, right. So it, it so I had somewhat prepped myself for that, but knowing how vibrant a campus this is and, and uh, you know, I look out the window here and I see the, the courtyard, you know, I actually see people out there today. That's a good thing. Um, but it, it, it's, it's been eerily quiet. Dr. Brown? Yes, sir. Uh, Dick Stein here. Um, yeah, Dick. I would uh, like to encourage you. I know you no doubt have a, a, a full um, program for the rest of your day, but I would really invite you to um, watch and listen to the, um, the history that some of us are going to present today. Um, all of it is a, is, a, is a loving tribute to Johnson County Community College. My having been here for 38 years uh, before I retired, gosh, I don't know how long ago, eight years ago, uh, it's still in my blood. And uh, we just invite you to, um, to, uh, to be around uh, for the rest of our meeting, if it's conceivable. I can do that. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah. I did oh. oh, this is Sally Gordon and I did oh what Dick said. Um, I have a question. Do, can we look at the board of director or the board of trustees 
um, I guess their resumes or whatever online. Is there somewhere to look at that? Yes. Um, if, 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 um, it, I, one place I know you can see it is if you go to the, the county, um, uh, Johnson County elections website, okay. um, and look up, uh, search by, um, uh, community college. Um, it, it's, we're not, there's no primary this year for the community college, uh, board elections. So you look at general election, and community college, and then you'll get the nine candidates, um, and they have links and and so forth. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions for Dr. Bell? I want. Is Dennis Day awake right now? I can't tell. Is he with us? Well, there he is. <laughs> He's here. Well, if we don't have any other questions for Dr. Bounty on one, we probably could start our meet as a regular part of our meeting. All right, this is uh, an interesting time for our meeting to go back and look at the history of some of the history of our college. Uh, some work has been done to put this together. It's amazing what they have come up with. And so uh, one of the key people was Phil Wegman who's the host who tends to know all the people that are around. So I'm gonna turn it over to Phil. Phil, you're on. Good to be here. It's an honor to be the host. I want everyone to know I'm filling in for Dave Ellis. Dave Ellis uh, actually started the, the memories uh, sessions. Uh, we've had one already and this will be the second we've had. So um, Dave couldn't be here. He asked me to fill in and of course I'm more than glad to do that. I'll start by telling you a little bit about my own experience with the college. I started, I joined the counseling staff in February of 71. At that time, we were located in the old Merriam grade school building, which later became the Merriam Community Center. And later, as you know, is not even there anymore. All the counselors at that time were on a nine month contract with the option of signing on for three months during the summer. Uh, but I became the very first 12 month contract person because during the summer we were very busy with students coming in and um, getting their programs set up. My first office was a custodian's closet which had to be cleaned out and made into an office. Um, it was located adjacent to the main counseling office. The college was growing very fast and counselors and instructors needed to be brought on board to accommodate students. Space was at a premium in the old Merriam grade school building and so that we had a number of other buildings, warehouses, uh, science building north on Merriam Drive, the old Shawnee grade school building. We used the basement of the, of the Merriam church. I know some of you, there'll be more uh, discussion of this as the presentation goes on, but we were spread out through Merriam Drive. It was an exciting time. We all knew we were on the ground floor of something really big. Uh, the college was growing fast. And finally, in August of 72, our current campus opened its doors with five main buildings. And our counseling philosophy involved meeting and developing a counseling relationship with every student with the goal of helping each student explore their career goals and then develop a customized plan of action or program plan of courses to enroll in uh, to follow to meet those goals. Much work at that time was done developing articulation agreements with the four-year colleges and universities. And there was some perception of some of the students who came. I'm, I know, I'll never forget some comments I heard from some students who told me, yeah, I want to come to JUCO before I go to college. So we had, um, <laughs> we had some of that uh, thinking from some of the students who originally came to the old campus. Because it, again, it was a, a modified grade school building. Um, the original plan we had in counseling was a decentralized counseling approach in which our offices would be located out in the faculty offices. Mine happened to be in the new campus in, that, in, the, in the science building, which Dr. Bound you just talked about was gonna be remodeled. Uh, I had an office that students could come through the main faculty entrance or they could come to my office through the, what we call the watering hole. 
Um, and I was assigned to work as the uh, nursing and health related area counselor. And uh, so it was a great time, an exciting time. Um, and we did a lot of things together as a group. We had a softball team, we had a faculty bridge. We had a lot of things we did together and it was a great time, an exciting time. So without further ado, I wanna to introduce to you Chuck Bishop. Chuck was a history professor and he has written the book, The Community College, a history of Johnson County Community College 1969 to 1999. So Chuck, you've got the floor. None of us really know what we were each, what we were gonna to say today. And here we've got the history of the college. And since I wrote this first, um, not really the first history of the college, but uh, one that spans several of the decades. Uh, the question I was asking myself was what can, how can that history inform us today of anything that's significant and what, what exists or persists from the past that um, that first uh, couple decades uh, was involved with that we either continue to wrestle with or issues that uh, never go away. And uh, as I looked at uh, the history, um, and we all of you know most of that, unless you're new to the college, I, on a macro level, we were really the product of basically three things. One, the university tradition of professional education and liberal arts. Second was uh, the land grant tradition, you know, of, of agricultural mechanic arts. And then thirdly, uh, probably the tradition of um, what I would call uh, local boosterism that took place especially after World War II and uh, really came to fruition in the, the 1960s. And so we come together on a, this strange new thing called a community college, strange in the sense that the administrators and staff wanted to get rid of the old designation of junior college because they didn't want to be junior to anything. And the, the other thing was part of that tradition was the universities Many of the faculty and universities never wanted to teach freshmen and sophomores in the first place. <laughs> uh, they saw it as lower level teaching and from William Rainey Harper at the University of Chicago in the early teens to the present, faculty have usually shied away from that uh, obligation. And so community colleges uh, by default inherited much of the, the university's disinterest actually in that kind of teaching. And together with the uh, local communities desire to have institutions close to them and their students at a lower cost, uh, keep kids close to home. After the 1970s, for example, really big influence in our growth of students was the riots that took place, the student unrest at KU and K-State, not so much K-State, but definitely KU. Um, and that brought an uh, increased number of, of students to the college. And when you look at the local conditions that existed uh, when the college from 1969 to the Harris years to 1975, President Harris, uh, you've got local educators really getting to this boosterism, wanting to create something new. And the dominant figures there were Will Billington, and uh, Hugh Spear was huge uh, UMKC retired professor, famous for his work in Brown versus Topeka. Uh, college has a lot of very interesting, important people, both regionally and nationally, that were a part of its past. And uh, when you start looking at it, you're always surprised at, the, at their influence. Well, Spear was important in what he's given to the college in the early years was he wrote the primary off the so-called blue book that every got everybody got. And what I remember is that when I came to the college, I came out of KU in a graduate program, uh, ABD without the dissertation, which I eventually finished before I almost died, but uh, 20 years later. But um, the blue book was this statement of philosophy. Uh, yes, we have no traditions that everybody is 
you know, aware of. But the big thing that was motivating them, they didn't want a replication of the university experience. They didn't want departmental silos. They wanted interdisciplinary education the, these community boosters wanted, and they wanted uh, to be up to date. So that meant a lot of technology, ABT instruction, and whatever else was um, the, the uh, hottest thing in uh, higher education, they were quick to jump at. So when that first group came together, there was a, a lot of enthusiasm to open up new doors and to do things totally different. And everybody had that feeling when we got there. But as one person told me the other day, when you got up and got your cup of coffee, you just weren't sure what was gonna happen that day. And at the end of the day, you weren't sure what, it, what had happened. But uh, going to work was an exciting kind of thing. And of the 20, two dozen plus original faculty and administrators, that early group had an esprit de corps that uh, very few people at the college at any time and place in any of the department or divisions has had. They all felt like they were in it together. And Bob Harris, who is the president, conveyed that and his administrators with the top-down administrative style uh, because of ex-military. And most, many of the fact, many of the administrators were all military, as you know. Uh, but there was this, this idea that you were going to be different, whether it be flying to Wyoming campus, that it was eventually one of his wild ideas that got shut down. We even had faculty and staff training. If you look at my history or if you remember Jim Jackson and uh, um, I can't remember, there are two others. There were a picture of them and they were working out in order to we were going to have classes in Wyoming on the environment. Um, they were going to be flying out, taking notes on airplane windows. It was a wild time. And uh, any of these ideas, of course, um, uh, were out there in the public venue and eventually got shut down. Some of, many, some, some of them did. Others of them came to fruition. Uh, and very different things took place on campus. But the major thing I wanted to emphasize was uh, this early group was um, bent on uh, doing things in a creative way, uh, trying not to follow the old molds. Uh, and in many ways, uh, they did that. But that lasted until 1975 when Bob Harris left. But more and more PhDs started coming into the college from graduate schools fewer high school teachers that uh, were, had been getting masters. They were being replaced by these PhDs, aided by the PhD glut. Uh, accrediting associations put a lot of pressure on the college to get rid of their interdisciplinary courses because they were having trouble transferring. Um, and um, all of those forced the college by the mid 70s, the late 70s, to become more and more traditional. And um, by the 80s, you know, you've got, by the late 70s, you've got uh, Cleek, uh, Cleek comes, uh, John Cleek comes in as president, much more emphasis on becoming a national force, um, much more uh, of a prof professional approach to administration than, than Bob Harris had. And um, we have a, 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 a whole different, enthusiasm and problems around the idea of shared governance and um, uh, faculty power. Then finally, uh, in the 80s, we get a more corporate structure with, uh, with Chuck Carlson. And we also get the faculty uh, coming into their own with uh, collective bargaining. Um, and you get into more traditional uh, forms of addressing one another. But the one thing you do get by that, uh, that time is a feeling that things can be written down, uh, that there are procedures uh, that everybody can follow, and we have a greater sense of security in, in, uh, in the workplace. But through it all, we also had some of the most important characters in the history of the college, and you all know many of them, uh, and you could all name many of them. But from Walt Kleiner to Fred Krebs, uh, to Art Hammond, who Tella traveled every weekend to Japan or China uh, and came back to land in his classes on Monday morning. Um, you had a wild group. 
uh, and uh, memories that all of us who lived through them um, uh, share warmly and uh, feel, uh, uh, I guess, warm and fuzzy about. But uh, we'll never be able to recapture that, I think, uh, with the institutional pressures that exist today. Gosh, is that me? Yep. <laughs> Art. Thanks, Chuck. Our next presenter is Helen Bernstadt. We're talking about staff development, or maybe, I'm sorry, Dick Stein, excuse me. <laughs> You're up. <laughs> Phil, you always wanted to bypass me. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, yeah, my, boy, that's, that's a strange looking fellow there, but I have to deal with it. The following is a montage of some of my favorite experiences while teaching at Johnson County Community College from 1971 to retiring in 08. Uh, I would likely never have boarded the JCCC boat had I not convinced Dave Axon and Jim Jackson to allow me to start a debate program. With my six years of coaching high school debate teams, I convinced them that I could start and run one at Johnson County. Our first national tournament for junior community college in Los Angeles, one of our teams won the cross-examination event. We still maintain occasional contact with those folks. And the picture that you're looking at is an on-campus display of, in this case, bragging on the, the, our third year's uh, results. Are you on the picture, Dick? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I, I think I was in there. You were. Uh, not, not, taking sure. credit, not taking credit. Yeah, I'm, I'm the one with the long hair. Mm-hmm. And glasses. Uh, my the th next thing I want to deal with is uh, one of the most significant teaching um, experiences, learning as a master teacher workshop. I know Helen is here today. So Helen, uh, I want to thank you from a distance right now. Helen developed the uh, Johnson County version of a worthy week away from our usual setting of the college. Uh, so it was often at St. Mary College up in Leavenworth. Uh, we went to some camp locations. Um, education and personal benefits flowed from these getaways. We met faculty and others we might not otherwise meet during our busy weeks at the college. I attended and was involved in at least six workshops. Early JCCC was a river of experiences to encourage and facilitate improved teaching skills. Um, see anybody on there you know? Yeah. Oops, there I am again. Third, uh, softball. My first summer as a JCCC Cavalier was partly spent playing on a slow pitch softball team. Carl Sneed played a mean third base. <laughs> Fred Krebs. Fred was a determined pitcher. <laughs> Wasn't very good, but he was determined to get good. Uh, Phil Wegman uh, caught Fred. I played shortstop. Uh, Don Doherty from Counseling was also a member. Regrettably, I cannot recall the other players without prompting anybody uh, listening and watching. Uh, please uh, interrupt me and say I was one of them. That is you. Uh, um, years later, Larry Rochelle put together a real doozy of a co-ed team. Of course, why does doozy sound familiar? Well, that was the name of the team. Again, camaraderie was a result of our efforts. Another extremely inter, um, Im impressive uh, uh, experience of mine was uh, being one of the uh, quite a few who spent three weeks in Russia. I was thrilled to share the college's international efforts by spending three weeks in Izhevsk in central Russia. Uh, we made friends with whom we still communicate and exchange gifts. A special unexpected treat of mine was to meet the famous, infamous, if you will, Mikhail Kalashnikov, inventor of the deadliest weapon a soldier ever could have. His special, he, he had his special weaponry museum there in Egypt, boasting his name, uh, was celebrating his birthday. I don't know which, it's in his 80s, but I'm not sure which birthday exactly. He was about five foot four. He was shaking hands throughout the crowd. Uh, one of, and 
one of those hands was mine. The AK-47 stands for the year it was completed. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, if you had if uh, if you'd finished it during the war, it might have been the AK-45. But he really he actually, in one way, failed his mission. But two years later, completed it. Um, <clears throat> I bought a copy of his book focusing on the development of the AK-47. It's, uh, it was written in English, translated to English, of course. Following my return home, Kathy and I were blessed as hosts of two of the reverse exchanges from Russia. The photo you're seeing is Gulia uh, Korenkova sharing her life in Russia with my granddaughter's grade school class. That's me again over there on the side. Uh, we're still friends on Facebook. Next, another impactful experience we had at the college was Christmas in October. This was not a college program, but the college got involved in it. Um, um, gosh, um, I, I have a, um, I should have written down who our other leaders were. Um, but um, I don't recall exactly when we first became involved in it, what year, uh, but many JCCC staff members were blessed with at least 15 years serving low income and elderly KC citizens by repairing their homes. Mm -hmm. Four of us coordinated the service day in October and dozens of our colleagues carried it out. Uh, the photo of me in my captain's shirt a related thanks to all those who made those days a success. Um, the other picture, uh, the, the one you're looking at now really, can show only a bit of the dedicated JCCC staff working hard and happily. No way I could have bored you with the pictures of everybody who contributed. Uh, next to last on my list is the, uh, the picnic. One of the college events was the welcome back picnic that was only fairly recently eliminated. No need, to rem or no need to remind you because we were all there with family and friends. It started, as I recall, with the opening of the new campus in the fall of 90 or 72. Picnic meals were served. Dr. Hugh Spear, former UMKC faculty that Chuck mentioned, and JCCC board members brought, uh, board member he was, brought his team of horses, pulling a wagon around for the kids and some adults and lots of other activities. What a way to start an academic year. And the picture of Jerry Wolfskill, my wife, Kathy and me, tending the popcorn booth at one of the latter picnics. Finally, <clears throat> Fred Cribbs, or I always often call him Mr. History. Fred Krebs, who died December 28th, 2013, was a cornerstone of JCCC, being the first full-time teacher at the college, at least he claimed that he was. He was a dear friend of mine and of many others. I mentioned him as the pitcher of our summer slow pitch team. That's the, last, that's the least contribution to give him. He embellished his teaching with portrayals of historical character. That is, of course, what he taught. In costume, including on the left, Galileo, in the middle, Christopher Columbus, and finally, William Allen White at White's Emporia home. Uh, William Allen White, I, I'm sure you remember, is a 19th century world-renowned editor of the Emporia Gazette, which is where I went to the university, is where I went to college. Fred had been a lifeguard, a Red Cross instructor, a swim coach in Miriam, and a Boy Scout leader. Fred was an Eagle Scout and Order of the Arrow. He was recognized for his troops receiving 20 Eagle Scout awards. As history professor at JCCC, he was given distinguished status in 1988. Fred was extremely well-versed in history and the present as a libertarian politically. I miss Fred even eight years after his passing. That's it for me, folks. Dick, thanks so much. Now let's hear from Helen Bernstadt and staff development. 
Thank you. And thanks to those of you who have preceded me, who took some of the things that I was going to talk about. <laughs> me too. Chuck, thanks for mentioning the Blue Book. That became my mantra for many of the things that I was able to do at Johnson County Community College, because in the Blue Book is the statement that JCCC will have an enlightened personnel policy. That gave us a lot of things that I remember fondly, and some of you do as well. Let's talk a little bit, Jonathan, would you move the slide, about the history. We celebrated the 20th anniversary of the establishment of staff development in 2003. And at that time, I received some remembrances and I only wish I could read all of these letters to you, but my 30 minute presentation has to be closer to 10. Um, you see Dr. Carlson, who obviously was instrumental in being sure that staff development became an integral part of what we did at Johnson County Community College. And a quote from Glenn's statement. In 1982, Dr. Charles Carlson determined that the role of staff development at JCCC should be expanded. And he approved the establishment of a formal staff development office with a full-time director. He assigned oversight for staff development to me as a dean, directing me to recruit and hire the first director. I remember so well that we had such a wonderful pool of internal candidates that we interviewed no one from outside the college. It was really difficult to identify the first or the charter director of staff development, but Jackie Snyder became that person. Jackie, in her remembrance, says, I was fortunate to serve as the first director and therefore had a bank blank sheet on which to create new programs. Committees were formed to plan and develop new and expanded programs such as special grants, sabbatical leave, faculty orientation, computer training. The IDP or the individual development plan became the core of what we did in staff development, the international exchange program and on and on. Awards were won presentations were given, involvement nationally took place. After six years, JCCC staff development program was widely known and respected. After Glenn left the college, Dan Bradakovich became the administrator overseeing the operation of staff development. Now let's go to what I consider to be my baptism by fire. I entered JCCC August 1, 1988. My first experience was with the orientation where I met all the new program directors, new positions, and new people. Then Glenn gave me a list of 50 people he wanted me to make appointments with and interview and find out what they thought staff development should be. And I bet you some of you were on that list. Next, he escorted me to the all staff breakfast where we stood at the door and he introduced me to folks as they came in. What an experience and no, I could not remember all those names. But then my next step in that baptism of fire was one of the early phone calls I got on campus, which was from Jackie. And she was so gracious in welcoming me as the new director of staff development. And then she se segued into, oh, by the way, we have an all staff picnic. It's scheduled in September. Nothing has been done. There's a folder <laughs> for you to look at. And then I'm sure you'll have some questions. So thanks to all of you who have already mentioned the picnic showing us pictures in the past and so on. We're going to give credit throughout my presentation to all of the people that supported everything that we did. And here is the early staff in staff development. Phyllis Nealon, Patsy, or Kathy Meisenhelter, Peggy Denton, and myself. The culture of the college was so important to what we were able to do. Not only were we recognized 
by being a member of the League for Innovation in community colleges. We were also very much involved in the American Association of Community Colleges, the Kansas City Regional Council for Higher Ed, and I could go on and on. But all of those things gave a lot of ideas to those of us who attended the programs and gave us some more things that we needed to do for Johnson County Community College. One of those things, well, some of the activity, early on activities that took place you've already mentioned. But one of the things that I'm particularly proud of, and I have talked to many, many places ar around the nation about the extensive award and recognition program that existed at Johnson County Community College. The years of service pins had just started when I came on, so you all know the, about those. I'm surprised that no one has raised their extra effort cup yet because Dr. Carlson loved the whole idea of extra efforts, recognizing people who went above and beyond the call of duty and contributed things to the college. He loved meeting with you. He loved talking to you and being the one to shake your hand and give you the cup. He also presented about that program at one of the AACC conventions. Burlington Northern had already started under Jackie, so that was already in place to recognize outstanding faculty teaching. Over the years, other awards were created. They included the Bob Frizzell Award, the AMS Award, the Outstanding Staff Award, both quarterly and annual awards, the Lieberman Award for Adjunct Faculty, and the Rookie of the Year Award. The Centurion Award was also given on a special occasion to recognize 100 semesters of teaching at JCCC. And I'm not sure if Dennis George was the only one that received that or if that was continued after I left. The next thing I wanna to go to is the creation of the Center for Teaching and Learning. If you will recall, this really started with Mary Lou Taylor's idea of creating a Center for Instructional Innovation. She appointed Walt Klarner as the first director of that program because Walt had received a, a major grant that provided five faculty members with opportunities to use technology in their classrooms. In the course of Walt's work, he did a lot of visiting other schools and listening to what other people were saying. And he came back with the idea that the Center for Instructional Innovation was really not the right term, that if we wanted a, compre a comprehensive faculty development program, it had to have a different title. By this time, Ken Gibson had joined us and Ken was very much encouraging of us changing the name of to the Center for Teaching and Learning. Our Center for Teaching and Learning grew through the development of many of you who served as the directors of the Center for Teaching and Learning. Walt started, Peggy Denton served from 1992 to 93. And I know you all are saying, she doesn't have to read this to us. Okay. so. I also wanted to include a picture of what our Center for Teaching and Learning looked like at that point in time. It was located in GEB 240, and we had lots and lots of resources available for our faculty and staff, and we did a lot of workshops in that uh, area. There was a time when the college really did what Chuck was talking about. And that was looking at what the thinking was that was going on throughout the nation. And we became a, a learning college. We adopted the notion of organizational development, at which time we changed the name to the Staff and Organizational Development Office, which was the umbrella for serving all employees of the college. Another one of the activities that we undertook. And I'm so sorry I didn't have pictures for all of these things. Um, was the creation of the adjunct certification training program. 
You can skip through the next slide, Jonathan, because we already saw it from Dick, and that's the Master Teachers Workshop. But out of the Master Teachers Workshop and the design for it and the discussion of what happened when those were held, we also created the Master Staff Workshop and the Master Counselor Workshop. I know that we had 10 Master Teachers Workshops over the course of my tenure at the college. And I'd like to have you look closely at the back of the t-shirt um, that shows the spider web. And we consciously chose the making connections theme for the master teachers workshop as Dick al already addressed uh, that we were crossing all those um, lines. We created the ACT program, Adjunct Certification Training Program. I could tell you lots of stories about how, what happened with that and how it came about. But Ken Gibson and Marilyn Reinhardt were definitely supportive of way more support for adjunct faculty than what had been in place prior to that. And I need to shout out for Lois Hardenbrook, who was instrumental in making that program work because she ended up being the secretary and the record keeper. The last slide is the active participation with the Chair Academy. The Chair Academy came out of the League for Innovation through Mesa Community College and was created as a way of training mid-managers in community colleges. We were involved from the very beginning, starting with Dick Scott and Ted White attending the very first conference that was held. Then Bill Lamb, Joe Gadberry, and I attended the first chair academy. And that's where we met Marilyn Reinhardt. And that's how she came to be at Johnson County Community College later on. Many, many of us attended lots of the conferences and attended the academy. This particular picture is a group photo of when the college is being honored and all of, I don't think all of the members who had attended the chair academy are in this photo, but Dan also came because this was the occasion of my recipient of the Elsner Award, which was created by the, lead, the chair academy. We continued to be active in NICSPOD and AACC. We received many awards for the program. And Dick, I loved your picture of all of your awards. And I wish I had the same kind of one for all of the things that were awarded in staff development. And then we came to 2003. And as I said, the last slide, Jonathan, we, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the establishment of staff development. My swan song was leaving after that 20th year. I retired and I left staff development in the very capable hands of my staff, as you see here. Judy Korb took over as director of staff and organizational development. Sally Gordon, Kathy Meisenhelter, Ed Lovett, and Josh Smith were members of the staff at that time. Ellen Moore had come back to serve as an interim position in the Center for Teaching and Learning as the, as the transition was being made. So thanks again to all of you that made my tenure, though it wasn't any 38 or 42 or 50 years at Johnson County Community College, but it was a wonderful run. I appreciate every time you volunteered. And for those of you that mentioned the picnic, there were 125 to 130 people that volunteered for the picnic every year. Thanks again, guys. It's been fun. Ellen, thanks so much. I have nothing but great memories of all the work you've done and all the great staff development functions that we had. We're next gonna hear from Dennis Day, Student Services. Hi, everybody. Uh, I joined the college back in 1984, so I was kind of a late comer to it. My introduction to the college was from the people that came before me, and Jonathan Bacon was one of those folks. 
that helped me understand what a community college was. I was coming from a private university and a state university. And it was a bit odd to see students go home at night or on the weekends and have nobody living on campus. So it took me a little while to figure out what was going on, but the, the most important part of it was to talk to people like Jonathan Bacon and, and Linda Dayton, who was the dean at the time. And if you pass, go to the next slide. One of the things that was tradition at Johnson County Community College was the types of activities that Jonathan had started uh, in student activities. And then Marty Wood take, took over and I came in after Marty Wood. Uh, that was my introduction to the college is these, this type of camaraderie and specialty type of ideas. Back in 1984, if you went into an office, you would see that poster sitting in everybody's office about that time. Fullcon, a uh, very unique program. But that kind of gave me ideas and understanding that Johnson County Community College was a little different place than many places that I've been to. Uh, and the idea of innovation with stu using students was the important part, not just with faculty and staff, but with students as well. Uh, making it a unique environment, even though we didn't have residential life on campus. So, uh, and by the way, if you look really careful right in the middle, there's Jonathan in there peeking through all those students. The next thing is, this was the next slide is the very first controversy on campus that I am, uh, was involved with. Uh, there was a, the original mascot for Johnson County Community College was called the Kinsman. And it was a male figure, looked like Daniel Boone walking around with a, uh, with a gun. Well, that had a couple of connotations with that we really didn't want to go with. So we, we hosted a contest on trying to figure out what the mascot for Johnson County should be. Well, we have a lot of different uh, input from a lot of different people, and it got down to several names that were the most popular. One, and we've talked about Fred Krebs a little bit today. Oh, stay with the Cavalier. Uh, Fred Krebs wanted to be known as the Bullwhackers yeah. for Johnson County because it had a very historical meaning to Kansas. Uh, another one was the Tornadoes, the, the Cyclones. The Cavalier was one of those that we had a big contest with. It got to be so strong that the board got involved and wanted to name the, the uh, mascot for the college. Well, that, for me, coming from an institution that had a lot of student involvement, uh, it bothered me a little bit. So I went to the board members and I said, look, can we allow the student senate to do that and be joint with, with the board of trustees along with that? I think that was the first time that the students and the board had gotten together on one issue. Well, ultimately, the Cavalier came out as the winning mascot and it's survived. Uh, that was 1985, 86. Uh, its rendition is a little different. And by the way, the actual picture of the Cavalier, that was from a student. We paid him $50 for the privilege of keeping that rendition. We were a very generous group of people. <laughs> the next piece of it, uh, as began to understand how the college was growing and wanted to be innovative. We also wanted the students to get more involved with what was happening on campus. So part of the strategy was to bring the most popular speakers on campus. So the next slide, some of you will remember Dr. Ruth, Dr. Ruth Westheimer. She was about four foot 10 very heavy German accent and had a TV show. She talked about sex. 
Now, what more could we ask for a speaker on campus to talk about and bring a, an audience in? So we put her in the little theater and we had a standing room only in there. The, uh, our security force at that point was getting mad at me because I had too many people in the room. And all I said was to my boss and the president was I would rather have an overflow crowd than a half empty place. And we accomplished that. The point was at that point, we began getting student participation on campus with events, with programs, with all types of things. That led to a lot of things for the students along with their student senate. Uh, we even established a, a student senate organization across the state of Kansas, which was the first time. I, I forget what the name of the group was that the faculty and the staff would meet once a year to meet with, but we got the students as part of that as well. So again, part of what I had learned from the Blue Book and from the Johnson County Community College mission was to be innovative and to be extraordinary within our compatriots. And that was an important thing for the students to understand too. And I think that helped a lot, a, a tremendous amount of participation with students along different groups and different clubs. <clears throat> but again, it didn't happen without the support of a lot of the faculty and a lot of the administration helping along the way and allowing us to do those things with the students. <clears throat> the next, next big thing, and uh, Lori didn't tell me that I had to speak for 30 minutes, but it's no. not gonna happen. <laughs> seven <clears throat> minutes, Dennis, seven minutes. <laughs> right. The next piece is, uh, there's a picture of the student center. Next slide. <clears throat> This is emblematic of something that happened within student services uh, around 2000. We were in five different buildings at the time and we were having students go from place to place to place as part of their student experience. Linda Dayton uh, got a great idea that it wasn't the most satisfying experience for students. So she began pushing for uh, and hoping for the resources to be able to bring all those services together into one area or one stop. As Linda left and retired and Pat Long took over uh, through her leadership and Dr. Carlson's leadership, we were able to build the student center with the idea of bringing all of those student services into one location. <clears throat> that eventually led to the concept of a one-stop shop that made us one of 10 schools in the country doing this, the only community college doing it in the entire country. We were a part of an IBM project <clears throat> that focused on the, the, the services provided to students and creating the student experience a little differently. Uh, thus, we've got the student center and it survives today in many ways as a model of, of understanding that students come first in the programs that, and the services that are provided at a community college or at a university as well. And many colleges and universities have emulated that as well. So <coughs> in my 32 years at the college, I came when there was, uh, I think 6,000 students on campus. When I left, there were 21,000 students enrolled. Uh, it, it was a tremendous time of growth for the institution. <clears throat> and Chuck mentioned about the camaraderie. Early in those days, certainly the staff picnic uh, and the beer at the staff picnic helped a lot with that camaraderie. Yeah. <clears throat> Along That's with the chicken. Nobody wanted us to give up. I know, I know, Helen. That's right. Helen. <laughs> and uh, I, I'll tell you the story about I was the tapper of the keg outside my office 
<clears throat> because I didn't drink. So they entrusted me with the keg. Uh, I can't, I can identify and, and give a list of people that were waiting outside the office, waiting, knocking on my door saying, when are you going to tap it? When are you going to tap it? But that's another day. <clears throat> but over the course of time, uh, so many of you were so involved with the institution and still are. And that's what made the institution so great. And I hope Dr. Baum understands the history that Johnson County Community College has had uh, since the 1969 Merriam days and to this magnificent campus that is there now. And uh, I hope certainly that it continues for uh, 50 more years. Dennis thank, like. Dennis, thank you so much. A lot of good memories there and a lot of things to really be proud of that you accomplished during your time, along with Helen and everyone else. Our next speaker is Lynn Knutson, Academic Support Services. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about my very early years at the college. I joined in 1983 after spending 11 years at Wichita State University where I had developed a comprehensive program of continuing education for health professionals. Like Dennis had mentioned, I had to learn the differences between a university and a community college too. I was replacing a half-time person who did just nursing continuing ed programming. And my goal was to replicate the program that I had built at Wichita State and expand it to other professional groups. Since Kansas had the greatest number of mandatory continuing education laws in the United States, there were a lot of opportunities for growth. Continuing ed and community services was of course smaller back then, but it offered a variety of programs under the leadership of Virginia Krebs, Linda Cole, Cody Copeland, and Virginia Freeman, such as continuing ed, community services, uh, personal enrichment programs, Project Finish, the CLEAR program, the Speakers Bureau, and many others. Richard Davis and I were the newbies. He was the executive director of the newly created Business and Industry Institute, and I was the coordinator of the Center for Continuing Health Education. My dean in the early years was Dane Lonborg. For those of you who worked with Dane in the past, you'll recall that he was a very good steward of college resources, which meant that it was not easy to get budget dollars from him to do new and expanded programs or to add staff. Dane had a great sense of humor and a kind heart, but I had to convince him that I knew what I was doing before he would give me more funds. Two hard-headed Swedes working together was a challenge at first, but we became good colleagues and friends, especially because Later, he really liked the amount of revenue that we were generating. He enjoyed pulling my chain in those early days, and he did a lot of grumbling about my continual asks for more money and more staff. One of the first things I asked Dane for was a personal computer because I'd used one at Wichita State, but back in 1983, almost no one had a personal computer on their desktops, maybe except for the people who were actually teaching computer programs. He kept asking me, what are you going to do with a computer? <laughs> I guess I convinced him because one day, Dane huffed into my office carrying a Radio Shack TRS-80 computer. And he plunked it down on my table and said, there, now you have a computer. And he walked out. I don't know where he got it, but it was really pretty funny because there was no software on it. So I had to figure out how to make it work. I contacted Rudy Gentry in the computer program and asked him if he could create something for me that we could use. And he did. It was rather rudimentary in the beginning, but it got us started to a much more efficient way of managing the paperwork for our various state licensing boards. One of the problems I encountered in the early days was finding space to hold our seminars. Credit classrooms were mostly unavailable to us, so that left Commons 319 as the only space that had enough capacity for our size of audience, and that was not always available either. Plus, I created an uproar when I asked to have the tables moved into a new configuration. 
However, once the Carlson Center was built, continuing ed and community services had the whole second floor for offices, classrooms, and a lecture hall. And that was like manna from heaven for us. I could move the tables to my heart's content back then. I began the program with nursing continuing education and then later added on seminars for other health professionals, such as social workers, physical and occupational therapists, nursing home administrators, respiratory therapists, dental hygienists, emergency medical technicians, dietitians, and others. Most of our seminars for health professionals were geared toward a, a multidisciplinary audience because that's how they work in the hospitals. With the growth of computerization across campus and some purchased commercial software, including uh, continuing ed management soft software, a room scheduling package, and, and mail list management, we were able to be even more efficient and grow the program more easily. The first director I hired was Margaret Willis, uh, who took over the nursing and allied health continuing ed programs. And then I started doing programs for attorneys, real estate agents, insurance agents, law enforcement personnel. And we changed the name of our center to the Center for Professional Education to more accurate, accurately reflect what we were doing. At one point in time, the police academy and the firefighter programs were moved out of instruction into continuing education under my area. So we also did some continuing education for them as well. Georgia Nessel Road was hired to manage those programs and also to, also to create a therapeutic massage program. We called her area the Government Services Institute and planned to expand program programming to the public sector. Kathy Peterson was brought in to develop the certified mediator program in concert with a local judge and a paralegal, and she began management of the insurance and real estate programs. Cosmetology was also transferred to us out of it to oversee that program, as well as the newly created massage therapy program and to be the West Park building manager as all of those programs and she was housed there. So I began my journey in continuing education as a coordinator and I ended as Dean of Continuing Education. In 2007, I accepted my final position as Dean of Academic Support within instruction and under the leadership of Marilyn Reinhardt and I retired in 2016. Throughout my time at the college, I was blessed with wonderful directors and support staff. They're the ones who made the program so successful by the excellent workshops and seminars and programs that they created and the great customer service that they provided to our participants. And I owe them a great deal of thanks. And thank you. Lynn, thank you so much. I have great memories of working with you and continuing education over the years. Many, many good memories. Thanks so much. Our next speaker is Lori Vogelsberg, Administrative Assistant, Student Services. Lori, are you there? Microphones I'm on yourself. As me telling everybody to unmute themselves, I forgot. <laughs> I, I, I uh, retired from the college in 2013 as the Administrative Assistant for Student Success and Engagement. I last worked for Dennis Day and we're gonna cover the Office Professionals League and the Office and Technical Staff at JCCC. Next slide, please. In the early 80s, the number of Office and Technical Staff at the college was relatively small. It was a time when we all knew each other, whether you were office staff, faculty, administrators, maintenance, the sense of community at the college was strong. In 83, we decided to form our own organization as a network for Office and Technical Staff on campus. This group was originally called the Office Personnel League. The organization, through the years, became respected throughout the college community. Our first meeting was held in 1983 when the name of the organization was chosen. Ideas were discussed for professional development, social projects, and activities. When it was first being discussed, the college was worried we were forming a union. Well, that was the least of our intentions. 
The first OPL board was installed in December of 83 and included some names you all recognize. Joan Carney, Betty Dow, Linda Jacobs, Karen Rogers, and Eileen Webicke. During our first year, we had several meetings, established our bylaws, scheduled professional and social activities, and organized fundraising events and collection drives. This was only the beginning. Our involvement with the state organization became stronger. Our fundraising efforts and our engagement in the college community continued to grow. We supported each other through our jobs, through illness, in times of personal need, and we celebrated accomplishments and achievements, new babies, birthdays, marriages, degrees, and most any else, anything else you could think of. We scheduled a variety of social outings from plays at Tiffany's Attic to luncheons and holiday parties, lots and lots of luncheons and holiday parties. But it wasn't all fun and games. We developed bylaws, elected officers, formed committees, produced a brochure, and our first logo was designed by Heidi Blake and Betty Glazer in 1990. The OPL newsletter called The Grapevine was established in 92 as a source of our unofficial communication from across campus and tips for increasing productivity, campus news, staff development information, and we even had our very own Ms. Opal, who served as our resident Dear Abby for OPL, OPL members. OPL gave office and technical staff the opportunity to participate in campus-wide committees, including staff development, the Women's Issues Group, the Student Affairs Committee, Special Grants, President's Council, and contribute to post-script post and transcript publications. We created our own events. Bosses Day, celebrations, OPL auction, the bake sales, annual holiday parties, and established an Office Professional of the Year Award, judged by outside professionals. And by the end of 93, OPL had over 100 members, most of the full-time ONT staff on campus. The organization continued until early 2018. Uh, the college had grown and there just didn't seem to be the interest and commitment in participating in this type of organization. Next slide. Next slide, please. Jonathan. <laughs> Next slide, please. I think you took a break. Anyway, our involvement with AKCCOP, the Association of Kansas Community College Office Personnel, began in the early 80s, but it didn't take long for us to be all in. We had members on their board contributed to the newsletter and in 1986, we held the first of four AKCCOP conferences on our campus with over 100 of our own office professionals participating. Our evening banquet called Club Commons set the stage for a nightclub atmosphere with entertainment by Ed McCarthy and many others. The show ended with Sue Bryson, AKA the Carol Bonnet cleaning lady as she cleaned up around Ed McCarthy as he finished his song. Ed played a great straight man, but he struggled not to laugh when everybody else was in stitches. And most of you probably have seen Sue in her performance. These conferences gave us an opportunity to work together uh, as a campus-wide team, provide uh, professional development opportunities, and highlight our campus and our surrounding community. From the moment we became involved with AKCCOP, we had representatives at the conference each year. And as you can see from the pictures, we always had a good time and we never missed a chance to dress up according to the conference theme. Attending the conference gave us a great opportunity to connect with each other outside of work, meet new people from across the state and see what sites the state of Kansas had to offer. Next slide. Fundraising was a big part of our organization. Our fundraising activity started early. We held our first independent fundraising activity in 88 with a baffle. You know, raffles were illegal in Kansas. We gave away a television, had a bake sale, sold OPL cookbooks, and the funds were used for scholarships for returning students. We continued with events like this and were able to present the foundation with a $5,000 check to establish the OPL endowment fund in 1989. Our first silent auction took place in the fall of 1990 with Charlotte Skelton at the helm. As we all know, the auction became an event the entire campus community looked forward to each year. 
The auction continued for 28 years as we continued to add to the endowment. Today, the endowment is at $48,800 and scholarships continue to be awarded both fall and spring semesters to students changing careers, returning to work or updating their skills. Next slide. Our OPL members and ONC staff believe in giving back to the community. Over the years, in addition to raising funds for scholarships, we raised funds, funds and supplies for agencies such as Harvesters, the USO, Heart to Heart, Crosslines, Special Olympics, United Way, and many others. As always, we can count on the generosity of the JCCC community to participate in our fundraising efforts. Next slide. Next, please. Mm -hmm. OPL members could always be counted on to participate in college events. From the cakewalk at the picnic to CERT training at the Fire Training Academy, OPL and ONT members were there. We attended conferences, won awards, helped out at events, and the list goes on. Many ONT staff went to other careers, including counseling, department coordinators, paralegals, office managers, teachers, and one even became an executive vice president at JCCC. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lori. Really appreciate that sharing. Really some wonderful memories there. Phil, thank you so much for running the show. I appreciate it. I want to say personally to each of the presenters, they were excellent. They, they added information I hadn't heard and some I had, but there were new information each time. And I want to thank you for all of the effort you took uh, to move forward with this thing. At this point, we need to move into the business part of the meeting. On the screen is the call to order. We have minutes. Do we have uh, approval of minutes from last time? Do you have a motion? I so move. I have a second. 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, committee reports. Lynn? Well, it's right there on your screen. You can read it. Uh, we currently have $13,135.24 in our operating account. Our scholarship fund balance is up to $16,150.31. Comments on this? Questions? All right, moving on to the next thing. Membership report. Lois? Yes, I think I'm unmuted. As you can see, we have 211 members, and I was just looked for a ago. I don't have the years for every member, but so far we've all worked there 4,309 years. <laughs> 4,000 years, huh? Yes, so that's a long time. And everybody, don't forget, if you know somebody that's not a member of the retiree group, hit them up, get them to join, and enter the $50 gift card. Each one of you will rent a gift card if your name is drawn. Excellent. Lois, you're up next. Membership challenge. I just did it. Oh, okay. Everybody <laughs> catch that? What we're trying to do there? Oh, and if you if you don't know if they're a member, contact me. You can find me on Facebook. I'll put my email out if anybody needs it, and I can tell you if they're a member or not, and then you can find them and get them to join us. Excellent. Excellent. This time, I'll turn over to Debbie and Lori, events and activities. Hello? Oh. We've had quite a year, pandemic be darned. We, we kept going anyways. Um, even in the midst of the pandemic, we had continued to provide events for our members. We've offered opportunities to learn about a variety of topics, including wellness, wine, travel, genealogy, history, photography, local and regional attractions, crafts, sustainability, and caring for others. In addition, two community service programs include were included to benefit the children of Operation Breakthrough. And because of the flexibility of technology, many of our virtual sessions have been placed on YouTube for later viewing. As more people have become vaccinated, we, are begin, we have begun planning 
in-person gatherings and have ideas for several more in the upcoming months. Since November of 2020, which was our last general meeting, we've had over 35 events or presentations with attendance of over 650 people, both in-person and online. Jelaine Crabtree kept our genealogy buffs busy. The crafts were put on hold until we can meet in person and the wine group didn't miss a beat. They kept right on meeting, though virtually throughout the past year. Their first in-person gathering in over a year is scheduled for later this month. Next screen. Next screen, and I've lost my document. Wow. Hang on a second. <laughs> this technology is gonna get me yet. I go too far, Lori. No, I lost my document. Is what happened here? I'd back up a couple, Jonathan, if you don't mind. Can you Where see that, you? Lori? There we go. This right. was a quilt exhibition at the Johnson County Arts and Heritage Museum where they had many quilts on display, many of which were made here in Johnson County. And it talked about the um, the history of the quilts and what they contributed to the county at the time. Okay. Next slide. And there's another one of the quilts from the presentation. Nice. Where are those at? They yeah. were at the Johnson County Arts and Heritage Museum. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. And then the next one is their favorite photos from 2020. This is an art exhibit. This is an exhibition. I'm having all sorts of issues here. Um, this one was a 2020 in review and offered opportunities for members to share their most interesting, unique, or memorable photos from 2020. Debbie. Yes, um, on January 18th, uh, Dr. Carmeletta Williams gave a Zoom presentation uh, entitled uh, Free Did Not Mean Welcome. Uh, it was in honor of Martin Luther King celebration, explored the emancipation af of African Americans, the free state experience and systematic racism that still exists today. Okay. And then following that, we have many other ones in turn. In my next now. <laughs> next we have more that, and yeah, that we had some general sessions. We had Tai Chi. We had a few other photo sigs. Um, we had the wine of the month happy hour kept going. Next slide. The Kansas City Urban Arts and Murals uh, was a Zoom tour that focused on murals and, and urban art in the Kansas City area. Next slide. The Love Kansas City art was from Donald Ross or his uh, artist name is Scribe. He's also the Children's Mercy artist in residence. That's cool. Yeah. It's on Southwest, that one's on Southwest Boulevard. This Mickey mural was done by Matt Gondick out of Los Angeles, and he calls himself a deconstructive artist. While this Mickey is looks like he's pretty much all in one piece, he's starting to come apart. <laughs> and that's the type of art that he does. It's generally cartoon characters, but they're they're coming apart. <laughs> hmm. Very interesting. Next slide, please. Yep. So. Uh on, on February 24th, the, the History of Southeastern Johnson County is a presentation by Anita Tebby based on her book of that the same name. Uh, and it, it gives the, the uh, history about the settling of Stanley and still the Stanley and Stillwell area. This is on YouTube. Good. Next. Next slide. Next please. slide. Jonathan did a great presentation on creating photo books and calendars using Shutterfly. He shared tips and tricks and some things to avoid during the process. 
Next slide, please. We had a couple more in between there. There was a museum history on tap presentation at the Johnson County Arts and Heritage Center and an elder abuse presentation done by Judy Gibbs, who is an attorney um, in the Kansas City, Jackson County, I believe. Next slide, please. Container gardening was done by Jennifer Stefanczyk, who is uh, Jean Smith's daughter. Jennifer is a master gardener and gave us uh, helpful information about starting our own container gardens, what types and varieties of plants to use, and potting materials recommended and types of containers. Genealogy continued, the wine continued, and Lindy and Joan McCrellis gave a Caregiving 101 presentation, um, which talks about all the things, ins and outs, you need to be aware of if you're caring for a loved one. April 6th, uh, the Johnson County Arts and Center slash uh, along with the jo Johnson County Parks and Rec uh, 50 plus uh, designed a, uh, a presentation for us. It was an, an hour's worth of information about the, uh, the museum, about their details about the center, the exhibits and the events. And uh, the, the Parks and Rec, they do the travel for uh, 50 plus. They have activities, events, classes, health, fitness, uh, performing arts, et cetera. Uh, I suggest that you look at the YouTube uh, presentation on that. It was, it was very interesting. And we love the, we love the, uh, we love the museum and, the, and Parks and Rec. This photo saying ready to hit the open road um, gave folks an opportunity to talk about post-pandemic travel and let them share uh, photos of their dreams and plans for their next trip or vac vacation journey. And I think we all are ready. <laughs> this was uh, on April 26th. That was the farm and solar, although we didn't really see much of any solar. But Stu, Stu Schaefer gave us a tour. This is in the, the greenhouse, and this is the aquaponics setup. So they have tilapia, and um, well, you'd have, you'd need to see the, the way it's set up. It was pretty cool. Uh, we also saw the composter, and then we saw different elements. Yep, okay, still... Yeah, more elements to the um, to the uh, aquaponics slide. I don't know if, it, if there's more slides on this one or not, but we saw different elements of the farm. Yeah, um, and then uh, which was really which was very interesting. And then um, uh, Christy Howell gave us a. A presentation in just the lobby of, I guess, the tech building. I'm not uh, toured that yet, but it looked really, uh, I can't wait to see it. And this is the um, Operation Breakthrough. Uh, their pantry was in, uh, empty, and so we promoted uh, a collection. And so we went out on campus, we got the word out, and um, were able, we sat there for a couple of hours. We got to see a lot of people, although everyone had masks on pretty much. So it was hard to tell uh, who, who, I said, now who are you? Uh, but um, we, we had a, a lot and there's a picture. Next slide, you can see um, on the next slide, the, yeah, we, uh, we had this, all, the, all these items. In addition to that, $270 and Lori and I took both of our cars full of stuff down to Operation Breakthrough and helped to fill their pantry. And they were um, really very uh, appreciative to our, our efforts here. And I think that's it for far as slides. Hitting Next slide. Yep, we had one more. Hitting the trails in Johnson County. 
Um, it's time to start getting back out and about and spring has arrived. Johnson, Jonathan shared a new survey of the Johnson County trails with locations and photos. Next slide. Genealogy and wine continued. We, some of us tried to go to the Master Gardener uh, Gardens in May. It was a little rainy. Um, several, uh, five of us actually went to the Nelson Atkins Museum and played miniature golf last week and it was lots of fun. We had lunch at Roselle Court afterwards. Next slide. We have some upcoming events that so are scheduled. Upcoming. Oh, go ahead. Okay. On um, July 15th, we are, uh, a, a bunch of us are going to Union Station for the um, uh, Aus Auschwitz exhibit, then not long ago, not far away. And uh, we chose July, chose July 15th at 10 a.m. The 10 a.m. Uh, is, is now full, 11 looked, looked like it was, the rest of the day looked good. And they, and they put, they, they let 200 people go through at a time. So once we get a little closer to, to the, uh, the 15th we'll begin talking in station several western states for this exhibit and we are the, the the second one and the last one and I'm, I'm not sure where it goes from here but i know it's a uh, there's a and there's a lot going on in town that pertain uh, events that pertain to this exhibit and uh as far as the future laura did you want to talk about anything else here yeah, we've okay. just got a few things coming up. The Johnson County Arts and Heritage Behind the Scene Tour is scheduled in um, at the end of this month. And this particular tour is full. Uh, if we have enough interest, we certainly can schedule another um, time to go. We also have an opportunity to visit the Veterans Community Project, which is the Tiny Homes Village in Kansas City, Missouri. And we would tour the um, tiny home and see their operation and then spend some time volunteering uh, and helping them out with whatever they might need that day. It could be in the outreach center or it could be in the warehouse. And the gal that we're working with there is actually a, was a teacher at Johnson County Community College and her son is attending there right now. Her name is Heidi Whitehill. Um, we have another session coming up on June 29th. John Nicholson is going to do a presentation from two to four on old time radio programs. He has, I believe, hundreds of them. So he's going to pick a few of them to, for us to hear and to talk about. Uh, let's see what else we've got coming up. We're talking um, with the college right now about having a table at the all staff breakfast in August. And it's unclear at this point what type of breakfast they're going to have. It'll, it'll be a grab and go, or if it'll be an actual sit down breakfast like in the past. But we'd like to go and pass on information about the JCCCRA. And then in September, we're planning to try and organize a picnic as kind of a post COVID welcome back a gathering um, for the JCCCRA members. So there'll be more information coming out on that as we get a little closer. Next slide. And then we have some things in the works. Um, there's more arts and heritage uh, exhibits. One is a mid-century modern furniture exhibit that's gonna be there, I believe through September. We've got more JCCCR chats uh, with Kansas City sculptures and possibly one in sculpture gardens around the country or around the world. We have uh, another presentation planned. And I am working um, on the, the Black Archives slash Jazz Museum, Negro League Museum. The uh, Smithsonian has lent the Jazz uh, Museum uh, photographs of Billy Holiday. And um, so we hope to see that, but the plan so far, maybe July 8th, we would start out at the Black Archives. We get a tour with Carmeletta Williams and 
uh, perhaps have lunch and then do the Jazz Museum and the Negro League and or the Negro League Museum. They're, uh, they're adjoining, so it's, uh, it's pretty easy to, to get between either one of those. Okay, Dick Stein has offered to do a presentation on the Russian expedition of World War II. Um, David, Dave Krug is working with Anita Tebby to do a presentation on rocks and arrowheads of Kansas. And Jonathan's looking at doing a um, iPhone tips and tricks revisited in sometime in the fall semester. Um, if we have somebody for Android, we might do one of those too. That's it for now. But if you all have any ideas, please let us know. I right, have Andrew Phil. You for all the work. Oh. <laughs> and Deb. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's been fun. And, and we hope I, I think you single handedly kept me sane during the pandemic. So thank <laughs> you. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> this this group kept kept us saying yeah we're good for we're good for each other <laughs> yeah Bill if you'd turn your mic on right yeah you guys want to talk a little bit about what's going on with our second scholarship and uh, we'd love to make it because we were a real really close so, go ahead. Well, I think the main thing we'd like to say is once we can reach another um, $10,000 or $20,000 total, we'll, ha be a, we'll have two endowed scholarships. So donations are welcome. Please think of the donations. Maybe if you're receiving um, the RMDs, required minimum distributions, you know, you can you can um, designate that that money go directly to the JCC CRA scholarship fund. Uh, and that way it does not count as income. Gotcha. Um, when you, when you take, when you draw a distribution, you can also um, contribute through um, the, uh, just through the contact in the foundation. Uh, they have a scholarship process where you can contribute on a monthly basis or an annual basis. So please, please keep that in mind as you consider um, our, our scholarship needs and supporting our students. We just need 3,850 more dollars to hit our goal of 20,000. <laughs> it's, it's close. So, and I th we've been static because of the things that are going on in the environment with us. I hope we make that before Christmas. No, I mean, before we start the year. So I, I look at it, talk to people and see what we can come up with. All right, Lynn, Phil. This, this is a is thank you letter that we received from the recipient of, of the scholarship uh, fund. And uh, I, uh, I guess I'll just let you all read it. It's really a nice letter. Yeah, I'll take. I'll give you a couple of minutes to read through it. I, I've, the third, the second from the bottom paragraph is really shocking. It is. Do we have any comments about this? Questions. This is very interesting. The scholarship that we gave that helped this one individual through the semester and they, they seem to have a mission underway. So any other comments? No. All right, next screen please. All right, election results. <clears throat> uh, thank you all who voted in the election, 114 people I think voted or something like that. Excellent. We try to make that convenient for everyone so you could do it online. So you could vote without showing up. We had people nominated and so forth. The people who are elected for next year, uh, and we have a rotation. We have people who are here, we're in three years and then we're on. And we can get back in if you want, so forth and so on. They are, the third year term, three year term, excuse me, goes to Jonathan Bacon, 
Dave Ellis, Lindy Robinson, and Gene Smith. All right, we've been sitting here for almost two hours. Is there any comments or questions? You can do that uh, down at the bottom by clicking on chat, leave us a message. Those that have stayed through the whole day, I think it's been interesting and enlightening for you. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, maybe. Yes. Yeah, I liked it. You guys did a phenomenal job. Phenomenal job. I, I, I don't know how I can say I appreciate it more. Okay, anything else, folks? Here's your last chance. See you later. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank Bye. you very much. Thank you. Thanks, for your help. Thanks for coming. Thanks, today. everybody. It was great meeting. You too, Lindy. Smile. See ya. <laughs> <laughs>